Hello and welcome to Croftlands Community Church on this beautiful January morning. We've had some snow and everything is bright and clean. It really is refreshing. And my prayer is that as we spend this time together today that we would all be refreshed as well as we spend time with God. Now I've come up here on the common uh, to be in the snow and among the sheep. <laughs> and so I thought it'd be rather lovely to start our service by reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One of the silver linings of the lockdown is that we've got to meet and get to know people from other churches. And today I'm delighted that our worship is going to be led by Rachel from the parish church. I met Rachel when we were filming the Nativity and she's the lady who played Silent Night as part of the Nativity. And so she's going to lead us in our worship today and we're going to start with the Lord's My Shepherd and then we're going to um, have the lovely song May the Mind of Christ My Saviour. And so thank you so much Rachel. Bye. 
I'm back in the warm. Now let's spend some time in prayer and there's so much to pray about at the moment. Earlier we read together that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even there you are with me. And at the moment that shadow feels closer than normal. So let's spend some time remembering the people who are poorly at the moment, the people who are caring for them, and also let's remember those who are grieving for the loss of loved ones. We can also uh, be grateful as well that with Jesus, death is just a shadow. Also, people are anxious at this time about jobs and businesses are struggling. We can lift them to God and young people are having to grapple with new ways of learning online. And all of us are struggling with unnatural restrictions. So let's spend some time and lift these things to God together.
Father God, thank you for your faithful love that flows towards us all the time. We ask that we would experience your love and your very real presence afresh today and that any fear in our hearts would be driven out by your perfect love. Thank you that you hold us and understand every aspect of our daily lives. You care for us as a shepherd. May this knowledge comfort us and enable us to comfort others. Help us to be more confident that during these uncertain times, you are at work, both in our lives and the bigger picture. Help us to work with you to share the hope of knowing you with the people around us. We ask that you would bless and guide the government at this time and all those who are faced with making difficult decisions and strengthen all those who work in the NHS and other caring roles. Jesus, we acknowledge you as our ultimate healer and thank you that one day you will wipe all tears from our eyes and the previous things will be remembered no more. We bring our prayers to you in the name of Jesus and all that he is. Amen. Jo gave me a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle that she got from a charity shop for Christmas. So between Christmas and New Year, I embarked on the challenge of completing the puzzle. I was really surprised by all the different concepts that came to mind as I worked on the puzzle and I'd like to share some of those things now. So here we go. Firstly, I was struck by the internal voices of condemnation saying things like, are you really going to waste all this time doing this puzzle? Surely there are better things you can do with your time. And this brought to focus the whole work re recreation balance that can lead to real stress in people's lives. God, in his great wisdom, commands us to ring fence time for rest. And Catherine has a plaque that says, time you enjoyed wasting is not wasted time. So having dealt with the negative thoughts, I was released to enjoy the puzzle. Next, I was faced with 1,000 pieces on the table. <laughs> I was struck by the concept that often it's much easier to start a job than to finish it. And this reminded me of the wonderful promise in Philippines chapter 1 verse 6 that says that when God starts a good work in our lives, he completes it. Thankfully, he doesn't give up on us. And as I said, Joe had got the puzzle from the charity shop, so there was a question mark as to whether all the pieces would even be there. This raised the issue of doubt and uncertainty, not knowing how the journey would end. This is how we often feel as we embark on a new year, and especially this year. This got me thinking that as a follower of Jesus, I am blessed to know that whatever the future holds, God holds all the pieces. And in his service last week, Mark um, mentioned that lovely song when the chorus goes, I know who holds the future and he'll guide me with his hand. With God, things don't just happen. Everything by him is planned. So as I face tomorrow with its problems, large and small, I'll trust the God of miracles. Give to him my all. This puzzle as well was also one of those puzzles that doesn't have the final picture on the box but only clues to get you going. And again, this reminded me that as we go through life, we don't see the whole picture, but God does. Then there were the joy-filled moments when you find two pieces that fit together. I could tangibly feel the positive endorphins. <laughs> this led me to reflect on the joy-filled moments in life when things just work out and fall into place. Almost as if there was someone behind the scenes with a plan. Another thing I noticed was that I could spend ages looking for one particular piece and not be able to find it, only to spot it immediately when I returned to the puzzle. How could I have missed it all that time? The Bible is a bit like a living jigsaw puzzle. You can read a passage several times and then read the same passage on a different occasion and something new jumps out at you that you've never noticed before. As we read the Bible and fit different parts together, we get a new and constantly fresh picture of Jesus. I know that each family in the church received a Gospel Gems calendar this Christmas. 
These calendars have a tiny part of the Bible for every day of the year. It may be helpful to treat each of these verses like a jigsaw piece. Explore them from a different angles, turn them around in your mind and try to fit them into your life. This activity will definitely enrich our lives. I'm pleased to say I completed the jigsaw and all the pieces were there, reminding me that with God, everything works out for good in the end. Just to say we do have a few Gospel Gems calendars left over, so please do get in touch if you would like to give one to someone. To conclude this part of the service, here are some words from a Lou Lewis song that capture some of what I've been saying. She introduces the song like this. Christians have a great deal to say about believing in God, but has it ever occurred to you that God also believes in us? He values us highly and has a special and unique personal plan for each of our lives. I believe in you and the things you can do. I see the finished picture because I'm the master painter and my hope never ends. I am your true and faithful friend, on this you can depend. I believe in you. I believe in you and my love will always be true, for I know that that's essential if you are to reach your true potential. You're a work of hidden art and I've already made a start. So open your heart, open your heart, for I believe in you. But out there in the world where the vision's always been blurred, Men put you down, left you fallen on the ground. But I speak into the pain, look into my eyes, rise up again, open your eyes, open your heart, for I believe in you. I believe in you and the things you will do. I see the finished vessel, because I'm the master potter, and know that I always see the person that you will be. So open your eyes, open your heart, for I believe in you.
Before we leave the Christmas season behind, I'd like to spend a little more time thinking about the wise men's visit to see Jesus. In our nativity plays and Christmas card designs, we tend to take some poetic license with the chronology of events and often have the wise men visiting Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the stable along with the shepherds. However, from the Bible account, this is clearly not the case. Matthew records that the wise men came to a house and Mary, Joseph and Jesus fled to Egypt immediately after their visit. Had they fled to Egypt directly from the stable, this would not allow time for Jesus to have been dedicated at the temple in Jerusalem, which Phil spoke about a couple of weeks ago. In reality, Jesus was probably a toddler by the time the wise men roll up. Interestingly, Mary and Joseph don't seem in any hurry to get back to Nazareth after Joseph had registered, but set up home in Bethlehem. Why did they stay and set up home in Bethlehem? The Bible doesn't say, but from a privacy point of view, Mary and Joseph may have been the source of much gossip in Nazareth due to the surprisingly quick arrival of Mary's baby. However, they would have been anonymous in Bethlehem, which I imagine would have been a much nicer experience for the couple. Having thought about the visit of the wise men recently, it seems that in many ways this event is a snapshot of the human experience. Within this part of the Christmas story, we have powerful people trying to hold on to power at all cost. People who deliberately lie and plot to harm others. People trying to find meaning and understanding in the universe. People who are victims of circumstances outside of their control. People who are overjoyed to find what they are looking for. People having to flee their homeland people grieving because of the injustice in the world, people revealing their instinct to worship, and God is right down in the middle of it all. Let's read about it in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. 
Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Let's briefly look at each of these points that make up this snapshot of humanity with all its joys and sorrows and see if any of them resonate in our personal situations. Powerful people trying to hold on to power at all cost. Well, we don't have to look very far to see this happening at the moment. I find it incredible that King Herod felt so threatened by a small child that he acted in such an awful way. It was clearly all about self-preservation and ego. The mention of a new king seriously rattled him and all rational thought or consideration for the people has been thrown out, as has been the case so often throughout history when a new contender for the throne appears. We see personified in Herod the deep sickness of sin in the human heart that is present in each of our hearts to some degree. How do I respond when I feel threatened? Would I crush another person to maintain the status quo or for personal gain? People who deliberately lie and plot to harm others. Herod pretends to want to worship Jesus, but his heart is full of envy and murder. Again, a sad reflection on how far humanity has fallen. We see here the clear difference between the kingdom of truth and love and the kingdom of hatred and lies. I'm surprised by the number of scam telephone calls we receive, people deliberately lying to try and harm us. The kingdom of lies and hatred can be seen in many areas, but thankfully Jesus' kingdom of truth and love will overcome. People trying to find meaning and understanding in the universe. The wise men are aware there is more understanding and knowledge to be acquired. They have a sense that there is a bigger story at play that is not confined to just this world, but encompasses space, the stars and planets. Thank God for the people of science who pursue ongoing knowledge and understanding, for telescopes that reveal more of the wonders of the universe and especially at this time, the advances in medicine and vaccines. People who are victims of circumstances outside of their control. Sadly, it seems that every generation of humanity has its victims. Millions of young lives lost during World War I and II. A generation of children in the Welsh village of Aberfan the horrors of the genocide in Rwanda, babies with HIV, the list goes on. In this story, it's innocent baby boys snatched from their mother's arms. Where is God in all of this? People who are overjoyed to find what they are looking for. On the other end of the scale, we see that the wise men are overjoyed when they find Jesus. Their mission has been a success. Their research has paid off and they are delighted to find the baby king. History is full of countless wonderful discoveries and achievements that have changed the world. Electricity, antibiotics, music, travel, radio, the internet. Where is God in all of this? People having to flee their homeland. And yet, in a world that has discovered so much, people are still having to flee their homeland, like Mary and Joseph having to flee to Egypt with Jesus to save his life. Desperate people across the world are risking their lives to try to find a safer place to live. People grieving because of the injustice in the world. The horrific heartbreak in this story was known about by God and foretold by the prophet Jeremiah hundreds of years earlier he speaks of great mourning and Rachel weeping for her children. Does the knowledge that God knew beforehand bring comfort to the grieving process or make it worse? We are currently living through a pandemic 
where thousands of people are grieving for loved ones who have died or are fearful for loved ones and themselves. Where is God in all of this? People revealing their instinct to worship. At the heart of this story, grown men kneel down and worship a small child. We are by nature worshippers and all of us worship something. It may be a, a false god, money or status. Perhaps it may be a celebrity, sporting personality or personal hero. Sometimes people worship themselves and encourage others to worship them. In Exodus 23, 35, God commands us to worship him. I've been thinking about this verse recently and meditating on it like a jigsaw piece, turning it around and looking at it from new perspectives. I used to imagine God sounding angry as he said this, but now I see it is actually a really loving command because to worship anything less than God is to shortchange and devalue ourselves. Also, there is a sense of intimacy that he doesn't want anything to block my relationship with him or come between us. And God is right down in the middle of it all. A few times as we've gone through this snapshot of the human experience, I have asked, where is God in all this? And the answer is right in the middle of it all. And not just in the middle of it all, but doing something about it, redeeming it. The gifts that the wise men gave Jesus symbolise that he was a king who would sacrifice himself to bring restoration and forgiveness and that justice would surely come. He would bring new life to the whole world whereby each and every life, no matter how short or prematurely cut off, is significant and has the offer in Jesus of being part of the massive renewal of heaven and earth. Jesus was 100% human whilst never ceasing to be God. I love exploring the concept of when, as the child grew into the man, he also knew he was God. There are many clues in the Bible, but if, as you grew up, you discovered, among many other things, that all your contemporaries were killed by an enemy in an attempt to kill you, what message would you take from that? Each of those little boys who were so brutally taken are still present to God in an even greater sphere of reality where they are held at the very centre of God's love, while they, with us, wait for the glorious return of Jesus when everything will be restored. God holds all the pieces and he holds your life too. I love this last song, uh, Jesus All for Jesus. It's such a simple song with such beautiful words um, and very much a prayer. So let's pray this song together as we sing Jesus All for Jesus.
As we set out into this new year, may we all be assured that God holds all the pieces of our life. And as we've just been singing together, may we live our lives for Jesus. And so now let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>